to introduce our fabulous speaker. Um, and I just only recently met her, but as soon as I mentioned her name, there were so many people that popped out of the woodwork that said how fabulous she was. And I'm just gonna give you a little intro besides her professional uh, intro, which was when I called her office, I was offered an appointment fairly quickly for somebody that was going through some stuff. And it was also in the evening, like at the same time. And I'm like, well, does she really work at seven o'clock at night? And you were so accommodating. The office you walk into, it feels like a comfortable living room. It's not this sterile environment where you're already uptight and nervous anyway. And you immediately made my entire family feel at home and comfortable. And also just sat down and was like, tell me this, tell me what's going on instead of like just not connecting the dots. So I so appreciated that. And I also, I want you to tell us about your heels, too, because when, when you see her come up here, I'm going to be like, pre-pandemic, I would have thought about it, but there is no way after that. There's just, there's no way. there's just no way. So anyway, so here are her, some of her stats, but she's just badass. I mean, which I could just say, here's Dr. Pointer, badass. So anyway, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Pointer is currently a gynecologist, a, a gynecologist oncologist and a pelvic surgeon dealing with gynecologic issues, hormonal issues, and a focus on midlife women's health and physiology. Her practice is transforming, focusing more on midlife uh, women's health practices, and she helps women primarily over 35 with hormonal fluctuations and then facing the transition into menopause and beyond. That big abyss. No hormones left, and we're looking for them in grass and straws. Anyway, so we'll talk about that. She, had, she, had, she had attended Columbia and Penn, trained at Sloan Kettering. She recently founded her private practice, Pointer Health, on the Upper East Side. Come on, Dr. Pointer. <laughs> <laughs> she helps women and in heels as well. So I actually asked you, and I just want to introduce you because I just think that this kind of tells a little bit of story. I said, so you're you're kind of she's kind of known for heels because one of more than one person, a friend of mine, said she wears these heels. <laughs> and so I then asked you about them, which I yeah. just loved the story. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the heels. So I always like to say I'm a tall person trapped in a short person's body. But um, while I was a fellow at Sloan Kettering, I was operating with some very tall men, actually. Most of them were between 6'1 and 6'5. And one of them had the audacity one morning to pat me on the head uh, outside the OR. He said, I'll teach you how to operate, little lady. And I was like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. So I said, how can we remedy that? And I just went to Bloomingdale's that night, and I said, give me your highest heels. And then I went back in the next day, and I just looked him in the eye. And that was, that's how the heels started. And then I just, I could say, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But I just, I love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Because it's it's embracing uh, many things and kind of standing up for yourself quite yeah. nicely, right? <laughs> so um, so anyway, so there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about hormones and and kind of whether you need them or not. I just want to start with some very basic things, okay? And this is a very bad PR like HR moment because Niall, who works in my office, <laughs> is sitting there. So we're going to talk about the vagina. And we're talking to say, we're talking to say, <laughs> so, so um, there's hormone replacement, but then there's hormone suppositories. So can we just start with kind of when you're going through menopause and the changes that happen with sex? So, so um, when women's estrogen levels start to drop, which can actually start to drop at between 35 and 40, right? As fertility tapers off, estrogen levels are starting to drop. So one of the first kind of signs of those estrogen levels dropping for many women is actually um, vaginal dryness and painful sex. And we don't really talk about it enough. And we don't, most physicians don't really ask about it if you're having you know, pain with sex and that type of thing. And people are really surprised that one day they wake up that they're having problems with uh, painful intercourse or painful sex. And so what happens is the vaginal epithelium gets very thin, and this can lead to problems with, with painful intercourse. 
And so vaginal suppositories or estrogen are one of the first things that we actually use um, for women who can use um, estrogen. Some women cannot use estrogens. Most women can use some topical low-dose estrogens even if you've had a history of breast cancer, but some can't. And, but for many women, then we'll prescribe like a local treatment of topical estrogen therapy. And, and it's really important that we get the word out that painful sex is not normal, right? And a lot of people normalize that, actually. And, and there's still a lot of women who kind of suffer in silence and don't really talk about it. So we need to get that message out there. So if you've had breast normal. cancer, you can use the suppositories, or you cannot? Well, I, or... always, say, I always say that the breast oncologist is the person who is, who is driving that, uh, that, that, um, that recommendation, right? So what we do in our practice for our patients who've had breast cancer is we, we offer either um, low-dose topical estrogens or low-dose topical DHEA also, because certain okay, drugs sorry, are just, just, Sorry, what's yeah. that? And, um, but always, Wait, what is, I'm sorry, oh, what is, yes. DHA. DHA is mm -hmm. another hormone that the body produces that the vaginal epithelium is very responsive to. And um, so for many women who've had an estrogen-dependent malignancy, they can use these low-dose topical estrogens, but some oncologists are very conservative and don't, don't want their patients to do it. So that I always say, you have to check with your oncologist, you have to check with your breast oncologist and before, before prescribing. So to, out of total respect to those people who are helping you, um, with your breast cancer situation, if you have breast cancer, then we, you know, we always defer to the breast oncologist. So for many women, they can. So before you get to painful sex, should you at a certain age, either should you, when you, because you've got a, uh, you've got a vaginal sonogram in your office, right? So are you able to see when the lining starts to get? Thinner, and then would you kind of preventively, because no one wants to get to the point where you're like, oh God, like this hurts. So should you be trying to keep your lining as thick as possible and kind of do it preventively? Right. And suppositories are tiny and little and you would maybe be using them a couple times a week or is it? So, so vaginal epithelium we don't usually look at on ultrasound, we look at it visually, right? And I think this is where it's really important to be aware of the changes that it could as our estrogen levels taper off, and also to, to, to engage your healthcare practitioner. And if you're having any issues of maybe stinging or just feeling a little dry, actually. Um, but, you're, but you should be paying attention to it, but your, your, physician, your physician or your practitioner should also be asking you about it. And, but you should be aware of it. And this is what we're writing a book right now, actually, about the things you need to know from 35 on so that you can be prepared for them so that you don't act when you're not, don't wake up one day surprised and you have painful sex, right? So there's little, there's little clues beforehand, you know, maybe if you're using a tampon, it's a little drier or if, um, or you notice a little bit more dryness and you have, have to use a little bit more lubricant, then these are things that you bring to the attention of your healthcare practitioner and your physician and, and, and talk about. So speaking about lube, so should you use a water-based lube? Like, is there anything, because there are lubes that smell like, you know, like strawberries and they're hot pink and it's like, you know, like that, that I wouldn't even like, I don't want it anywhere near my body, let it know my yeah. vagina. Yeah. Just like, so what is, what is so, that? Because I would think that that would cause more problems. Yeah. So, right, so those can throw your pH off, the vaginal microbiome, right? And especially if you're transitioning through menopause or you have lower estrogen levels, the vaginal microbiome or the bacteria that live in the vagina are super, super important. So uh, less additives, better. More natural, better. Um, Water-based or oil-based, if you oil-based is okay, actually, if it's pro appropriately pH balanced. So it's like like an olive oil. Uh, yeah, <laughs> olive oil actually works if you're not using condoms. But if okay. you're using condoms, you can't use oil-based lubricants. But there's a number of really good ones on the market now, actually. And Yes is a really great product. Um, I'm sorry. It's called Yes. And it's yes, 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 yes .org. Okay. And okay. Okay. Write that down. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, that's, this company is, they were way ahead of their time. And they, um, about 20 years ago, actually, were talking about natural lubricants and natural vaginal moisturizers, mm -hmm. um, free of chemicals, free of parabens, phthalates, all that stuff. And um, they have really great products. And they have a whole line of products that range from either um, moisturizers, lubricants, oil-based, water-based. And I think it's, it's like paint. Yeah, it's like, it's like hard. Yeah, yeah, they have like a lot of products now. They used to have two, and now they have fifty. So yeah, there's a lot of. But more, the more natural, the better. The less additives. You know, the things that are like heat up and things like this can, can cause a lot of burning and pain, and what we call vaginal dysbiosis or the vaginal microbiome can get off. So when <clears throat> is there a correlation between getting older or the lining of the vagina getting thinner and UTIs? Absolutely. 
This is why, even if you're not UTI, it's a urinary tract infection. This is why, even if you are not sexually active, it's important to maintain good vaginal health, actually. And um, definitely, UTIs become more um, prevalent or more common um, when your estrogen levels start to drop and go down. Actually, it's super important. And most urologists, if you get to a urologist, right, will talk to you about some topical vaginal mm -hmm. estrogen. Also. Okay, so, so if you're getting a series of UTIs, so, um, so somebody that I know was getting UTIs pretty regularly, the estrogen levels were not being checked at all. And you know, they're not somebody in menopause. So I would, I would have thought because, because she, you know, sometimes the estrogen levels when they weren't tested for something else had gone lower. Um, so even if you're not, even if you, I mean, when you're going through UTIs, you should also have your estrogen levels checked. Wouldn't one think, even if they're not in um, Sometimes we go by history, sometimes we go by levels, estrogen levels, sometimes we just go by history. And it's important for younger women to realize that when they're on birth control pills, the vaginal epithelium can uh, become quite thin, actually. So even if you're not in menopause, but you're using birth control pills, maybe for contraception, or even to control perimenopausal symptoms, that's a time where estrogen levels actually are paradoxically low in the vagina and you can be more predisposed to urinary tract infections. But always important to correlate to exogenous or hormones that you may be taking, natural hormones and, and what's going on in terms of any type of what we call pathophysiology or any type of abnormal or, or, or problems that you may be having. Right, so, so get, a, get a, a urologist to go ahead and check you out to make sure that there's nothing underlying going on. Correct. Right. But, uh, but if you, you need to, uh, to check the estrogen. But, I think it's really an all around picture because that's what I loved about coming to you where it wasn't just because that's what, um, you know, the person that we were uh, visiting you for, you know, was being told to just like take an antibiotic every time they had sex. Yeah. And that was insane to me. I mean, that was insane to me. And I was like, there's gotta kind of be another way. And that was not one doctor, that was like four or five doctors. Now, obviously, if that's I mean the only way to do it, but um, one of the things that started to happen, and, and I I know you spoke to this, was when you're taking antibiotics, then the kind of the chemistry gets all screwed up. So, can you talk to that a little bit sure. in terms of what else you, you're testing for? Because then there's kind of yeast infections and. Right. Mm, so, so there's um, something called a microbiome that inhabits our body. And we talk a lot about gut microbiome. That's why you take probiotics, right? That's why you eat um, uh, uh, sauerkraut, right? Dr. Hyman talks about that a lot, right? So, but there's also a vaginal microbiome. There is a breast microbiome. Um, so, but the vaginal microbiome is super, super sensitive because the vagina usually is acidic compared to the rest of the body. And when you start taking antibiotics, you select out, you kill, the good you kill some of the good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria. And then the vagina then becomes less acidic and becomes more alkaline, the pH goes off, and then everything starts to grow. And then you don't have a good, what we call lactobacillus, and that actually then makes it, you know, allows all the bad bacteria to grow because lactobacillus actually controls what, um, what grows in the vagina in terms of bacteria. Remember the vagina, not to get too graphic, is right next to the anal region, and um, next to the urethra and the bladder. And so these, are, the, these microbiomes are all very interconnected. And then you throw more antibiotics at it, and then you just get the, the microbiome gets off, then you get bacterial vaginosis, yeast, urinary tract infections, and a more modern way, and this is what we always call our, our, we hope that our practice is a little bit more modern, is realizing the importance of the microbiome. We hear a lot about that micro microbiome, and we need in gynecology to talk more about the vaginal microbiome. And we want to bring the pH down. We want to put in good lactobacillus. So in treating like chronic yeast infections or urinary tract infections or bacterial vaginosis, we actually want to bring the pH down with something called boric acid and um, put in a good probiotic. And so these are old, actually they're very old fashioned ways to approach a problem. So they're the putting others. them together? They're putting, mm -hmm. yeah, they put them in as Yeah, well, we make them together in a suppository. The compounding pharmacist does that for us. So what's well, kind of old is new again, but now we know why the old-fashioned stuff actually works, because now we know about the microbiome. Uh, there's a lot going on down there. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm still 10 o'clock at night. So, so one of the things that, again, I, you know, I talk to my daughters all the time about sugar, alcohol and like no one wants to be Debbie Downer and say you shouldn't have alcohol you shouldn't have sugar but I have found later in life that when I do drink 
which is kind of sugar, and yeah. um, and when I am having a lot of sugar, uh, that I'm achy, like the, the knee that bothers me sometimes bothers me more. Yeah. And so I know that you were talking about kind of the correlation between even yeast infections. And again, I don't know if somebody has had that, but is there a dietary component to all of this as well? Yeah. So there are, there's a few components if you're having chronic infections, right? And also the issue with sugar is it's just super inflammatory. So that joint inflammation, that pain in your joints that you feel from sugar is actually from inflammation. And that inflammation can occur in the vagina, it can occur anywhere else in the body, actually. Um, and also when you have, eat more sugar, right, it allows bacteria and yeast to grow. It allows many things to grow, actually. It provides them the substance to grow. So if you're having problems or you're having a, an imbalance of any part of your body, then definitely um, sugar can exaggerate that imbalance. And then there's some people who have actually immunodeficiencies that can have some chronic issues where there are antibodies that we secrete actually into our mucosal surfaces. <clears throat> and if you have an immunodeficiency, then you may be more prone to one of these kind of type problems. But sugar is inflammatory, allows bad stuff to grow, including cancer cells. And it's, it, it causes neuroinflammation, cardiac inflammation, allows cancer to grow. So if you can minimize sugar, um, it's, it's always better to minimize it if you can. How many, um, this is completely not in your, I think coming out of the pandemic, I know a lot of women friends of mine said, I know I'm drinking too much. How many, and this isn't a judgy thing, but how many drinks a week of, I mean, like when you're, when yeah. you're taking that kind of information yeah. from a patient, yeah. At what point would you say, hey, listen, that's a little bit, no more than? So for, for women, you know, it used to be, you know, I'm old enough that we, that I can tell you back in the day, the American Cancer Society used to say, oh, two drinks a day is okay for women. We, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And cigarettes. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, right, it's not really a right? right. So, um, so that went down to one drink a day and for women and cancer risk, and then to three drinks a week. And, and actually, there's a lot of statements that are coming out now saying, like, no degree of alcohol is actually safe. And if you listen to, um, if you listen to Huberman, right, Scared Straight, if you listen, he's got a great podcast. I'm sorry, who is, he, yeah, so Huberman is like, there's, there's a group of, and I'm sure you guys know about a lot of these guys, Sinclair, Huberman, and Tia, they really look at longevity, medicine, health span, and Huberman has like a really great podcast. I'm sorry, that, so what's the name of the podcast so we can write this down? Um, Atia is the drive. Huberman, I think I'm sorry, Huberman. Atia? Atia, Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A, -T -T -A, just came out with a book. And his podcast is called The Drive. He's got like a ton of great information. Huberman is Huberman Lab. Um, I'm sure he'll have a book soon, I would imagine. And um, then David Sinclair has a podcast also, and it's a longevity podcast. But anyways, but if you listen to Huberman, he'll tell you that no degree of alcohol or alcohol consumption is safe because of the metabolic effects in the brain and what it actually does to the brain. That's kind of an unreasonable way to live for most people. Yeah. And if you look at the, um, if you look at some of the cardiac data, actually, you know, a glass of red wine is is good. It's cardioprotective. So I think we have to look at kind of everything in again in um, uh, in, in a holistic fashion, in a 360 degree fashion, right? Because if you're not drinking but you're not exercising and eating like not great food, then that's not so good, but maybe if you're having a glass of wine a day and you're eating a really super healthy diet and you're exercising, that might not be so bad. So these studies are a little bit all over the place. Many of them involve the Western diet, um, which is not a healthy diet. And so um, I think that, again, I think uh, minimize alcohol exposure, and, um, but, but again, probably one glass of wine is not a bad thing. So going back to, actually, you know what, while we're, while, while we're going down the path of kind of like, kind of, you know, staying healthy, let's just talk about testing. So what do you suggest in terms of, is it still standard practice over what age should you get a mammogram? Is, should it be once a year or, or tell me what your thoughts so, are about that. And then you know, sonogram, right. and what about a cat? Like a, like a, like, is it a, is it a breath, it, no, it's a, there's the, the mammogram, sonogram, and then there's a. There's a breast MRI. So and MRI, MRI. Yeah. So, you know, the recommendations really are to start screening at 40 um, for mammogram screening um, every two years up until 50 or so. And then, but the American, and then every year after that, the American uh, College of Breast Surgeons, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, actually recommends a, a yearly mammogram starting at 50, uh, at, at 40, sorry, and proceeding on with that yearly mammogram um, from 40 on. 
Um, you know, my husband's breast surgeon, we always say that we could, you know, fill rooms of lives that were saved by a mammogram done on a yearly basis. The problem with doing a yearly mammogram is the specificity that sometimes we find things that are not clinically significant and leads to biopsies. If you look at the data, um, the survival is not changed if you do a yearly mammogram versus an every two year mammogram, but some of that survival of breast cancer is, uh, you know, you need chemotherapy. Like, so why, if you have a more advanced breast cancer, so you're gonna survive, you're gonna be a statistic that you survive breast cancer, but you need chemotherapy. So one way to look at some of these recommendations is do your yearly mammogram, actually, because you're gonna pick up something probably earlier on an, on an annual mammogram. You may have some more biopsies, but our 3D mammograms or tomosynthesis are a little bit more specific and a little right. bit better. Go to a radiologist that has a 3D mammogram machine. You have to ask about that. Dr. Cole is the one I use on the upper side. Go ahead. Um, and then if you have dense breast, um, which many women have, um, then you should or have a, breast implants. Yeah, for implants, you should have a screening ultrasound. And um, that just helps to detect cancer a little bit better if you have dense breasts, because if you have very dense breasts, it's hard to see on the mammogram anything. And is it, um, does, it ch does it catch something different? Like, is it, it does. Is it a different? So yeah. you could have something you could see on the mm -hmm. mammogram? Correct. It's complementary. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's complementary. And but they're usually not covered by insurance. Uh, they, they should be. I mean, they... they, they I have, they, I have an insurance yeah. company oh, insure one breast, yeah. not the other. Yeah. Like, oh. I'm going to do the left one and not the right one. Like, I kind of like the right one better. You're right. But, you know, I mean, like... <laughs> That, that's the, that is um, the, the, uh, the strategy, I'll say. I want to say the game, but it's really a strategy of getting something pre-authorized and covered. And that, you know, we have an entire employee who sits in our practice who just does that all day trying to get tests covered. Um, and then there's a breast MRI, right? And so an MRI is our most sensitive way to detect breast cancer. It detects up to 98, 99% of breast cancers. But it also has a lot of false positives, so that you can end up with a lot of biopsies. And, um, and we usually reserve breast MRIs and actually mammograms for women who are less than, or ultrasound screening or mammograms for women less than 40 based on family history or a genetic predisposition. So um, again, you need to really review, you need to know your family history, super important, and know three generations of your family history, you know your father's side of your family history. Um, there's still this misconception among some doctors, oddly enough, that breast cancer and ovarian cancer can't travel down your father's side of the family, which they certainly can, and can be a little bit trickier to detect, right? Because your father might not get ovarian cancer. So um, important to know your family history. And then we will change our guidelines and screening recommendations based on family history and then genetic risk also. So for ovarian cancer, um, is there really any screening? I mean, is there is there is there anything that you can do? Yeah. So um, there's a lot of new technologies that um, are coming down the pike, hopefully, for screening for ovarian cancer. Um, you know, liquid um, biopsies now are gaining a lot of popularity, if you know the, the, the testing now. So what that means, we look for tumor DNA in the blood, right? So ovarian cancer is very difficult to screen for because it just seems to, for lack of a better word, blossom or explode in the abdomen kind of all at once. Like, there's not one mass that develops, but they all, it kind of just it develops at once. And it probably comes from the fallopian tube. Like a lot of our, most of our ovarian cancer probably comes from the fallopian tube, which is very difficult to see. So screening data with ultrasonography, which has been our standard way to screen, and some tumor markers called a CA125. Um, Wait, and, hold on, you gotta slow it down, yeah. sorry. So you would have a sonogram on your on your ovaries? Correct. Oh, so, so if you have any family history, or like what would you, what would you suggest, so, like at what age? Or? So we usually um, screen women who have a family history of either uh, breast or ovarian cancer. Or, or have colon have, cancer. Or colon cancer is very important. Um, and also have a, a personal history um, or symptoms. You know, always we should, you know, we... What would the symptoms be? Um, pelvic pain, pelvic pressure, urinary frequency, maybe some unusual fatigue even, actually, early ovarian cancer can present with. Would there be bleeding, or would that be more of a... Mm -hmm. Yep, you can okay. totally have abnormal bleeding, so bleeding off cycle or bleeding after menopause. Um, and so, but these tests are very, usually we find cancer when it's later, actually, and so not so, not so effective. Um, but with our new molecular technologies, there's some new molecular technologies that people are beginning to look at, even with a pap smear, looking for tumor DNA on a pap smear. So um, out of like some of a lot of our, our, our newer molecular technologies, will probably come some better screening techniques. So you were saying sonogram, but then you said 
bunch of letters. Sorry. So, so yeah. So, that, we, that so we usually so we usually combine for a lot of screening we combine a radiologic study that gives us a vision with a blood test, looking for tumor markers, um, which are typically proteins that are associated with cancers. But now those tumor markers may actually be pieces of DNA in the blood that we might be looking for in the future. So it's usually a blood test combined with a, with a radiologic test where we look. So one of the things I want to mention, and I do this all the time on Instagram, it's another reason to follow me there because I will entertain you. But um, when I go to the dentist, inevitably, they will say, we need to take x-rays. And I said, no, you don't. We do not need to take x-rays of my head every time I'm here. If I've got pain in my, my tooth, you'll take an x-ray. And they push back. But when I do have to get an x-ray, they don't cover me up here. Okay, They don't cover here. And the same thing when you go for your mammogram. You have to ask when you're being screened to have the neck brace or to have your ovaries covered because they have the, the protection there and then they don't give it to you. And I'm like, do you have it? And they go, yes. I go, then tell me to wear it because, you know. So anyway, so does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if anybody has to get an x-ray, ask for the protective covering for everything else that is not getting a picture taken. Thank you, that's my public service announcement. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so the, the cancers that kind of, in terms of family histories, I have a horrible family history of colon cancer. So colon cancer is, can be colon, breast? Colon, breast, ovary, pancreatic, melanoma. I mean, yeah. we're in a time now where we've linked a lot of cancers together um, through genetics because we do a lot, of, a lot of genetic testing now. So you have to look for subtle changes in family histories now, and you need to make sure that your healthcare provider is, knows all of your family history, super, super important, because now melanoma, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, um, ovarian cancer, all can be genetically linked through different syndromes, actually. And so should you get the BRCA, is it, and, and would that be fall under the typical, like the BRCA gene? And this is, a, this is also a little bit of a side note. Many people that I know have gotten diagnosed with, you know, even early stage um, breast cancer. And may, I mean, maybe you'll agree with me, but this seems to have been like, I, I don't, and, and, the, and the, I would think the first question that they should, or the first test that they should get in deciding what kind of treatment would be to have that genetic testing right away because it takes a while to get back. Like, do I have the BRCA gene so that I can figure out whether I'm going to have a higher likelihood of this breast cancer turning into something else? Would that be, or, or, or should you get the BRCA gene test and at what age if you can afford it? Because again, it's not oftentimes covered by insurance. So, so we're, when we first, when the BRCA gene was first cloned, like in the 19, early 90s, late 80s, I don't even forgot the exact date, you know, everybody did a bunch of hand wringing, like how are people gonna handle information about a cancer predisposition gene? So the only families that we tested, or the only people that we tested back in that time period were uh, individuals who came from these very high risk families where you could almost see that there's definitely something genetic going on because there's cancers in each generation. Um, we then became more comfortable with the testing, and now we test more individuals. We have a much lower bar to do any type of genetic testing. And now BRCA, we used to test for BRCA1, BRCA2, and Lynch genes. Those were all kind of cloned at the same time, and those were the panels that were used by Myriad at the time. And now we have 85 cancer predisposition genes that we can test for. So we have actually lower penetrance genes, which means that the families may not have as many cancers, but you may have a significant risk of a cancer. So now we test for 85 genes. Um, you know, is that a crazy expense? Like no, no, actually. Okay. So this used to be thirty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. Now it's two hundred fifty dollars. And so oh, for so many, and you can even order the kits on Amazon. Okay. Like, and I'm sorry. <laughs> what's 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 the name of the or what is the what's the umbrella? So, um, so, the, so the testing is done, Marion still has testing, Ambry has testing. So it's Marion is the name of the, of of the, the, company. Of the company. And what are you testing for? And then those make up cancer predisposition panels. And then, and but we you want to do it with a doctor, so they can actually yeah. look at it. probably shouldn't be doing it on Amazon. Doing it in my office. But you can order the kit on Amazon. 
Um, <laughs> and then in terms of age of testing, again, another thing that's changed generationally, you know, our kids are the kids of the information age. Like they love data, right? And they're good with data. So a lot of my very younger patients actually want to be tested. We used to say, don't test until 22 or uh, somebody can handle it emotionally. And now our, our this generation coming through actually wants more information. And so, and it, it also we have new technologies that you can freeze eggs if you're BRCA positive or Lynch positive. So we have all these great new reproductive technologies that we should be offering our younger patients also. And so, I, for me, I mean, again, both of my grandmothers died very young of colon cancer. Mm -hmm. I went in without a prescription and had a colonoscopy. Didn't find anything. Something just kept telling me to go back. I went back two years later, and they found something that would have killed me. And that was in my 30s. So, mm -hmm. and I've had a melanoma. So it's just like, I just feel like, hey, that just gives me the information that I just need to get tested more frequently. You know, and just to, like, it's not a scary thing. I feel like it's being proactive. I, you know, the problem is, is what you put your head in the sand. And there's, unfortunately, I, I have a lot of women friends. And I, I, I will just tell you, if you're afraid of something, just tell somebody. Tell your friend, tell somebody, because maybe they'll make you go to the doctor. It's a scary thing to walk into yourself. You're frozen a lot of the time. But it's the waiting that's the problem. It's the not testing that's the biggest problem. You know, there's a lot of things that can be cured and taken care of, and we have badass doctors uh, to help you. You know, that's that's really important. So don't get frozen. You know, that's that's when we get into trouble. Um, is there anything else you want to kind of say on that topic in terms of anything else that we should be getting tested for? Um, I think it's. I think. Know, know your family history, know the screening. I mean, colorectal cancer screening, actually a lot of people um, don't know, starts at 45 now, actually not 50. And, um, and also the other thing I would say is listen to your body. You know, it's sometimes we know that something's wrong or something's off, we have a little fatigue or we feel a little unusual, feel a little different. And I think that's really important, especially with malignancies and or precursors to malignancies. You know, if you see something that you don't like on your skin, make sure it's looked at and you're 100% correct. If you pick up something early, most every solid tumor is picked up early and you can, you can cure it or have a great longevity. And it's when it's picked up late that it's a problem. So kind of, you know, it's knowledge is power. That's the myriad slogan, but right. knowledge is power, but it's really true. So I'm gonna steal that tonight. The, um, so, it, it, so let's just talk about kind of hormone therapy. Um, I pretty much kind of sailed through menopause. I mean, I just felt like I got my last period of 50, I was done, and it was like, I had a few odd flashes, I was good. But a lot of people are emotionally all over the place, exhausted, freaking, and just like a, like, a, like a wide variety of things. So at that point, and you know, for home, hormone replacement therapy, the, the one thing that I've just heard that is, that is if you are taking estrogen, that you need to be taking progesterone. Is that? If you have a uterus. If, if you, you don't have, have a uterus, uterus so it's the okay. 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 So tell us just about that. And then tell us just in terms of when would a person need it? What's, what symptoms should we not be feeling and, and are always food to say, like, it's no big deal? Because I think a lot of people, like, just have been lulled into the fact that they don't need to feel great and you should be feeling great. And if you're not feeling great, let's figure out how to make you feel great, right? Especially by male doctors, sorry. But um, anyway, so tell, tell us about kind of the hormone replacement therapy. Not your husband. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so, uh, so, yeah, so there, some women are not so responsive to hormones in terms of feeling lousy and other people um, are extremely responsive to hormones. and. And these individuals may have, like, not be able to take birth control pills, um, may have problems with postpartum depression, actually. And there's some people who are just very sensitive to their hormones and their hormonal cycles and this type of thing. Some people, like yourself, like go through menopause and don't have any problems or any issues. And I don't think we know physiologically or scientifically why that would be, right? But there are 97 symptoms of menopause, actually, or hormonal imbalances. And the FDA actually, I think, recognizes two, maybe three. They recognize hot flashes and vaginal dryness. Yeah. So um, we have estrogen receptors all throughout our body. I always like to say from the tip of our head to the bottom of our toes, we have estrogen receptors in our brain, our bones, our heart, our muscles, bones, and joint. Like everywhere there are estrogen receptors, so our body is responsive to estrogen. 
And um, there is a, the old fashioned, so again, old enough to have seen this transition. Um, in the old, older days, um, when we would uh, take out ovaries, we would, for, for whatever reason, we would put people on hormone replacement therapy immediately in the hospital. We'd say, you know, you should be on hormones, it's gonna protect your heart. And then the Women's Health Initiative study came out in the early 2000s, which um, set women's health and um, uh, midlife care back like 50 years, I'm totally convinced. It was, a, it was a really bad study. It was a poorly done study. It looked at Primpro, which are two medications that we don't use anymore, and it looked at a population that we usually don't use hormone replacement therapy for. And this study said, well, the risk of breast cancer is too high, and your doctor shouldn't be prescribing any hormone replacement therapy because you may be protecting the heart at younger ages, but you're causing breast cancer. So I was at Memorial at the time, and we actually sent out a letter, stop your hormones immediately. And so everybody came up with hormones, and then every doctor became scared to prescribe hormones, and then it became a somewhat emotional thing. And, but, but actually, if you read the literature, there was, and this is a problem in women's health, that there is a disconnect between what is going on in the labs and scientifically and what goes on in the clinics. Like people, there is no translational care between what goes on in the lab and what goes in the clinic. Great translational care in cancer work, cardiac work, but just women's health, like little, and so, but the data was percolating that actually hormones are good and can be helpful and they can be done safer. And there was a, so now the, the medications that we use are called estradiol and we use natural progesterone. Natural progesterone doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer the same way that our uh, synthetic progestin did that was studied in the Women's Health Initiative study. So Women's Health Initiative study, that drug was a bad drug, increased the risk of breast cancer, but we don't use that bad drug anymore. But if you look at how we treat cholesterol, we get a bad drug, we don't say, well, we're not gonna treat the disease. Right. We, we, we just throw out the drug and we say, what are we gonna study next? But with women's health, we just threw out the problem, right? And didn't recognize it anymore. So, um, so for some women who are really suffering, and this is a personal story, actually, at 43, I was a cancer surgeon running a private practice, actually, and I was like, oh, I got a little anxious, I had a little depression, and I'm not like a depressed person, usually. And I don't usually have a lot of anxiety, and I was like, something's wrong. And it was my mom who said, I think it's your hormones. You know, it seems like you're a little off. And so she goes, like, take some estrogen. It really helped me. And that's what I did. And I actually got a lot better. I didn't have those mood, those very subtle mood disorders. And um, at the time, there was nothing in the literature about mood issues and menopause or depression and anxiety with menopause. Now, the, lit the literature, there is literature to support that neuroinflammation occurs when our estrogen levels go down. Um, and it can lead to some mood issues, and of course, cardiac issues, bone health issues. So a lot of what happens when our estrogen levels start to fluctuate, actually, which they start to fluctuate wildly around the time of perimenopause, is you get inflammation. It goes back to that old-fashioned inflammation that you get with sugar, right? Um, and you can develop all this inflammation through the body, and this is probably what gives us a lot of the symptoms of when our estrogen levels are fluctuating, because very low levels of estrogen can give you inflammation, very high levels of estrogen can give you inflammation. So there are many symptoms of as your hormones start to kind of taper off. <coughs> Vaginal dryness is one. Of course, hot flashes that everybody knows about. But mood issues, joint pain issues can occur. Um, uh, athletes, it's so interesting. In our practice, we're starting to work with a lot of athletes who, my performance is off. I can't run the marathon the same way as I could run it before, you know? And so actually, our athletic endurance and stamina actually is dependent on, um, on our hormonal status also. So for women who, are, who have significant symptoms, um, maybe it's cognitive memory issues. I have one of my patients says, I work so hard to get to the head of the boardroom, I can't remember my name yep. now, and I'm there. And so, yeah, so big, big one. So, so for these individuals, we wanna help support hormones, right? And we wanna do it in a safe way. Um, but you have to know these symptoms, and your doctor or your healthcare practitioner has to know these symptoms to understand that Maybe you're not missing periods yet, and maybe your estrogen levels are just starting to drop, or maybe you're missing a period here and there, and your healthcare practitioner say, oh, it's normal to miss a period here and there, but maybe you're missing more periods here and there. And so, but the time to catch all of this, because the one big thing that happens that a lot of women will complain about is increased weight right here, and um, just, um, and, 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 and like five, 10 pounds, I can't move it, I'm eating the same way, I'm exercising the same way, and I just can't move that weight, and that's insulin resistance. And what happens is, is and we see this in animal models, and we see it, I see it you know, 30 times every day, that as your estrogen levels go down, your insulin, you become almost pre-diabetic, right? 
And so, and this makes it metabolically very difficult to move. And this becomes unsafe. You can develop metabolic syndrome, actually, for some women. So for, for individuals who are having issues which um, may be impacting their quality of life or their, their metabolic status, then it's time to talk to your, your healthcare practitioner about whether hormones, you know, whether hormones are, are estrogen and progesterone support are reasonable for you. Um, you know, Atia, Sinclair, these names I've mentioned, Huberman, you know, we're entering into like this great renaissance of medicine, I think, and I'm so excited. It's why I wake up every morning where we're really starting to understand how cellular processes at the cellular level impact the entire human body, right? So now we talk about mitochondria and cancer. We talk about mitochondria and dementia. We talk about mitochondria and cardiac health, which is so fascinating because we're beginning to learn the basic ties at the cellular level which link our body and link our physiology together. And estrogen impacts a lot of these cellular processes for some women, not for everybody in terms of how, how the, their metabolism is working. But so, so it's important, even in terms of longevity now, that we look at women's health and longevity through a hormonal lens also. And um, we actually recently discovered a pathway through research that links like every symptom and problem with low estrogen levels together. Like you can take every symptom and you can look at the paper in the literature and you can do a straight arrow, a straight thread through it and look at this one pathway. And um, this is an, an inflammatory pathway. And if we can impact this for women, whether it's through hormones or if we can understand it through small molecule inhibitors for like our patients who can't use hormones, we can develop small molecule inhibitors of this pathway. So the pharma companies are already beginning to do that a little bit. So, um, so this is where we're going right now in terms of is how important is estrogen for longevity? And if you can't use estrogen or support your body with estrogen, then can, can pharma develop small molecule inhibitors? And so I was talking to one of my colleagues from Memorial, actually, who was my PhD, PhD advisor there. I called him this January 1st. I was like, Andy, I found this pathway. I need to like, figure out how to study it. You know, will you help me? And Andy's like, a, he's a big full member, a big time you know, cancer researcher, and he, he does longevity work. And um, he goes, oh my gosh, and he has a longevity company. And he goes, oh my gosh, Elizabeth, you just gave me the model for accelerated aging, it's menopause. And so this is a very profound statement because this is a time where our body starts to change and you know, we start to have the effects of, of aging. And so the question now comes up, I think, with hormone support on some of these pathways is how can we impact them to increase the health span of women and not only our lifespan, but our health span. So we have a health span. That is, that, like, that is awesome. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I I think of hot flashes, and so if I'm not having hot flashes or I'm not having mood swings, but when we were talking about the brain fog, like that, absolutely, there's some times when I just can't, like I can't think. Yeah. And I do find also it has to do with diet. Um, Lynn Janae Ratias, who's, uh, who's, who's a great, uh, she studies inflammation, and she was explaining that as your hormones change, you know, the chemical makeup of your body is changing so that some of the, the food that you would be eating normally, that you ate at 30, it's fine, but you're, you're digesting it differently. Yeah, really, yeah. And so it, it can affect you, you're either gaining weight from it or it's making you not feel good or get bloated or, you know, have inflammation from it. Um, but it, it's all changing. So you really kind of have to be, again, know thyself, know your body and, and, and kind of you know, know that you, you, you really deserve to feel good. I mean, that's, that's really important. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that, you know, we're gonna open it up to a, a, a few questions and then obviously you've got a wonderful doctor that you can reach out to and have lots of uh, time with her individually, but are there anybody that has any questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for um, giving us such a wide spectrum of Honestly, there's so much cons about hormones, and I think there's a tremendous amount of pro from an inflammatory process. Can you comment a little bit more on testosterone and the role that it plays in in the grand scheme of things? Because I know that some of the hot things that are going on now are testosterone pellets. Um, so I've always been inquisitive about it, but haven't heard anything substantial. So so, so, test, so we use a lot of androgen replacement therapy in our practice, and um, there's not a lot of studies related. Oh, and what, what is that? Uh, testosterone. So testosterone is androgen, male hormone. 
And actually, we have more testosterone in our bodies than we do estrogen, actually, and but totally ignored in women, and not well studied, actually. And there's like one or two papers relating to women's health and testosterone. There's a lot of papers relating and a lot of studies relating to libido and testosterone. And because testosterone was brought to the FDA 15, 20 years ago to be a treatment for low libido in women, and um, for some women it worked, for some women it did not work, and it didn't work for enough women for the FDA to approve testosterone for women as a treatment for lower libido. But testosterone is very important for women. It can affect memory, can affect mood issues. Um, I call it the joie de vie hormone. Um, can affect libido. So for some women have very low testosterone levels and that's normal for them and, they, and we don't usually replace it if you're not having problems. There's no data to support um, yet that just get, prescribing testosterone if you're not having symptoms of low testosterone, which may be lower libido, lower energy levels, um, lower uh, 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 lean body mass, more fat, um, to prescribe it. Um, but it's poorly studied. I mean, there's literally like two papers in the literature. Um, so ways to, uh, to um, uh, use testosterone are either through a cream that goes on your arm, vulva, vagina, um, you can do injectable IM injections, you can go do a lozenge that goes on the tongue, and the other is a hormone pellet um, with, uh, with testosterone. Um, hormone pellets, you get very high levels of testosterone and then they taper off and then they turn into estrogen. Some people love them, some people don't love them. Um, they are certainly not FDA approved at this point and there is no testosterone that's FDA approved, however. We're going to take two questions only because I, I, I promised that we would be done at 8.15 mm -hmm. and we're close. Yeah. So. Uh, sorry, I have questions about breast MRI. So you mentioned that you know, it is too sensitive. So there's a lot of false positive, right? And that would lead to unnecessary biopsy and unnecessary medical <coughs> suffering for patients. On the other hand, I love that you mentioned that even though the overall survival stat between women who does a lot of early screening, women who do not screen, is the same. It is the quality of life because she doesn't have to do chemo. That's something I did not think about. So in that sense, are you actually sort of advocating that it is always better to be more aggressive with screening, even if you can get some false um, positive? I think that um, I think that the standard recommendations of an, I, I, I actually in my practice I follow the standard recommendations of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, right? Of a mammogram, I usually add an ultrasound each year. MRIs are a little dicey. Um, the other thing you have to remember too with an MRI, with a breast MRI, there is some risk involved in that you have to have intravenous contrast with it. And there is that intravenous contrast can affect your kidneys, and there can be some gadolinium deposition in the brain also so that you don't want to continually expose yourself to gadolinium or the dye that we use for MRIs if you don't need to. So I think with the MRIs, because there is a downside to it other than just the biopsies um, and false positives, but there's also like a possible, there's a possible um, uh, adverse event, you know, outcome with ga excessive gadolinium. So again, that's one that I'm much care more careful. I mean, I'm careful, but I'm trying to be careful with everything I do, but extra careful in terms of any type of Test that I order that may cause have a downstream effect that is adverse. Actually, so because you follow standard practice, would somebody with a therapeutic score, let's say about twenty, you would recommend? Of course, that? yeah, twenty over over. Yes, of course. Anytime you have a, 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 a lifetime risk of over twenty percent. Okay, so what is? I'm sorry, what was that? What was so there's ways to calculate your lifetime risk of breast cancer based on um, age of your first period, age of uh, how many children you've had, family history. Um, and if this calculated value is over 20%, um, we usually recommend that you have MRI screening. That kind of, that, that's, that, that not, every, not every breast surgeon actually likes that recommendation, actually, but if you have a crystal clear MRI that's easy to interpret and easy to read, then it's a great test for you. If you have a muddy, what we call a muddy MRI, that has like a lot of enhancement to it or just a lot of spots that we're trying to figure out what is going on, then it's not, it's not a great test um, for that individual maybe. But certainly uh, um, with anybody who has a, a lifetime risk of over 20%, they should always have a conversation with their radiologist and their prescribing physician about whether an MRI is right for them. Actually, I just want to circle back only because when we were talking about the, the not the in-home test, but the testing for the umbrella of the 89 different types of, of markers. Mm -hmm. What would you do with that information? You would just say, I'm going, I mean, depending on obviously what it is, I mean, you're this, just getting followed closely? Yeah, so, so. I mean, I guess because that's what we're talking about. Here, right, like yeah. 
Usually we're talking about when we're, when we are doing genetic predisposition testing, we're usually testing for genes that predispose you for cancers that we can screen for. So in that situation, we'll either recommend more um, intensive screening and surveillance, right? Maybe we start younger, maybe we do things more frequently. Um, maybe for some individuals, we'll recommend prophylactic surgery, actually, where we will recommend um, a, a prophylactic gynecologic surgery or breast surgery. Um, it's always important, and this is why the person that's taking care of you or guiding you, um, I like to say your consulary, through all of this, that they're, they're knowledgeable, you know, because you want to make sure that you're getting the right information for the screening, and, and, and that's something that these programs don't exist right now, and they're screaming out to be developed, actually, like you have a genetic risk, and we're having these more nuanced genes, like BRIP1 is an example, or CHECK2, these are, these are genes that you'll hear about, and we don't, you have to have a knowledge of the risk associated with these genes to craft a surveillance plan. So, you know, for example, institutions like Sloan Kettering or academic institutions, it's screaming, we need these programs. We need to have, like, where can you go to get this information? And we try to do that for our patients, and we would love to programmatically be able to develop that. Okay, two more, two more questions. <laughs> yeah, this <time. laughs> One more, one more. Good, good, good. Um, for, for estrogen, I have read that it, it can cause, or there are studies where there's an increased chance of dementia when using it after the age of 60. Yeah. Yeah, that just came out, right? So, so, so our old data with Premarin, right, was so Premarin is, an, is, is a set of estrogens that come from pregnant mares' urine, and um, not a good drug for many reasons. Um, and but so there, that early data with Premarin was that it was not protective against dementia and might in, increase risk of dementia. But then estradiol, our, our more natural estrogen that we prescribe now, it became that is probably protective against dementia. But you have to use it at the time of the perimenopausal transition or earlier on. You can't, you know, say that there, there was just a study that just came out that was published in JAMA Neurology that shows that if you do use it later in life, that there are increased signs of, 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 of physiologic signs of dementia. So I think, you know, we'll, you know, we just learned a few, a few years ago that actually estrogen actually really protected the brain, right, given at the time of perimenopause and menopause. Um, early in menopause. So these are, these are the questions that need to be answered, but there, that study did come out, I think, Tuesday, a couple weeks ago. One question, then we're done. The, I, we could see it here all night. <laughs> Sorry, I got it. Just linked to the, the hormones, I see there are like a lot of out over the counter supplements. They have something, I can't remember what it's called in it. So, Soy something or other. Yeah, so there's what do you a, think of all that? A number of estrogens that are called phytoestrogens that they are weak activators of the estrogen receptor. So they activate the same estrogen receptors that estradiol activates. And these are like black cohosh, red clover, evening primrose oil. There's a number of them actually. And, and usually these over-the-counter supplements come with mixtures of these phytoestrogens. And they're weak activators of the receptor. So for some people feel much better. Maca is one. Um, some people feel much better actually using these um, over-the-counter supplements. And with any supplement, though, you have to be aware that there's absolutely no regulation of these things. You don't know that what you're buying is what you're getting. Um, there's no, so you just have to realize that, you know, they're not like you're buying, um, that you always are getting in that bottle what you buy. So um, for my patients who use supplements, and we certainly recommend them, we certainly work with them, we always use like name brands that we know the brand of, and we don't use third party distributors on Amazon, and you know, we make sure that people are getting what we think and hope is the real thing. They do internal testing. Do you have a recommendation for a brand? Or? Um, Pure Encapsulations is good. Designs for Health is good. Um, those, are, um, those are good. Thank you. I, we're good. You want to ask a question?